Welcome to 91.9 Public Affairs and APSU TV. I'm Micah Terrell. It's hard to believe we are almost three years since COVID co came in and rocked our world. And we here at Austin P are doing the best we can to find some kind of sense of normalcy as we all work together as a team, students, faculty, staff, and community partners. Joining us today, Dr. Maria Cronley. She's our provost and senior vice president of academic affairs. Thank you so much for stopping by and having talking with us today. Thanks so, for having me. So, I'm yeah, excited so, to be here. And it's first welcome to our studios here Thank at you. the Music Mass Comm Building. This is your first time on the air with us, so it's great to have you. And again, obviously, you've been with us the whole time since the lockdowns and everything. Mm -hmm. Please kind of um, talk to us first about how you came to join our Austin P family. Well, great. Well, again, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here and join you um, and have a chance at last to sit face to face and have a conversation and, and uh, um, so how did I come to be at Austin P? Well, um, I um, was, prior to this, I had spent my whole career in Ohio. And so I had taken a very traditional path in my career. I um, actually worked in marketing uh, for several years, about a decade, prior to going into higher ed. Uh, then I did my PhD at the University of Cincinnati after um, having some opportunities to teach as a community business person. Um, really fell in love with teaching and said, hey, I want to do this when I grow up. So um, went back for my PhD. Then I took a really traditional faculty path, assistant associate full at a university in Ohio at Miami University uh, in, in Oxford, Ohio. Uh, and then that was really like the second stage of my career. Then uh, uh, around 2011, um, I moved into higher ed administration, really unexpected. Um, I, I wasn't planning to, to move into an administration, but, but I did and um, found myself uh, at, in the role of provost at Ohio Northern University and was serving there um, and was excited to, and, and enjoyed that experience. But it was a smaller private institution and, and I had really spent my career at one type of institution, really that more um, sort of that private, heavy residential kind of community and was really looking for my next provost role to be at more, one, a public institution, one an institution that was a little bit bigger, uh, and another that served um, a, a wider um, community, a more diverse community. And so Austin P was really appealing to me when I saw the strong ties to the military, um, our very diverse body of faculty, staff, and students. I really wanted to to explore this opportunity. And so um, I was fortunate enough, even though we were at the be very beginning stages of COVID, I was fortunate enough to um, have an interview. And um, uh, interestingly, I did the entire thing on Zoom. So like many people being hired during that time, I made a decision to move to Austin P and to move to the state of Tennessee, my first time ever leaving Ohio. Um, completely through a Zoom interview. And so I really hadn't had an opportunity to visit campus or interact with people before I made the decision to move here. But I'm very glad that I did. Um, and that's really how I came to be here. So um, I'm fortunate that, I, that my partner is here and that we are very much loving living and being in Tennessee. And what was that like, that first time being here? Oh, super scary. <laughs> oh, sure. So, um, well, for one thing, I knew upon arrival on campus that I really wasn't seeing campus as it truly was meant to be, and that is it was, it was shuttered right when I arrived here. Um, campus was still beautiful. It, it was interesting. I remarked as I was walking around campus, you know, when I first decided whether I was going to take the position, I did have an opportunity to kind of walk around closed campus. Um, I was amazed at how beautiful the campus was, but it was eerily quiet. And, you know, all the buildings were locked and all of that. Um, and so it was, it was, um, it was a different experience and, and a little bit scary. Uh, and unfortunately, um, I had just come from being a provost at a university and we were fighting, but we were struggling and fighting a lot of the same battles that we had here. And so it was one of those things that I had just gone through a whole planning phase of how to shut a campus down, how to pivot us to remote operation, how to teach classes online at that university. So fortunately, I was able to take some of those lessons and just move them over um, to Austin P. But really for that first year, really year and a half, we really were just in reaction mode. It was, it was really, I think everyone probably recalls, it was all COVID all the time. 
and it was really just trying to make sure that we could serve the students in the best way we can while protecting the community. So I think it, for all of us, it was a time of managing through uh, a time of a, a great stress, great uncertainty, and doing a lot of things no one had ever done before. So in that way, it was incredibly stressful, but I also feel blessed because we, we all, there was a lot of grace given and um, a lot of grace, grace taken. And so I think everyone was incredibly understanding um, toward the fact that we were all trying to just get through COVID. The other big transition for me, which I think people forget about, was I had three presidents in my first nine, you know, my first year here, because within weeks of my arrival, President White, then president, decided to, to exit um, and take a presidency in, in, in Texas. Uh, and then we had an interim president in, in President Whiteside, and then um, finally went through the search for President Lakari. And so uh, I was, it, it was dealing a little bit with that transition too and that uncertainty uh, and making sure that I was trying to the academic side of the house and the enterprise to make sure that, again, we were serving the students, faculty, and staff as best we could and that we were being as stable as we could be during that time. Right, and that's so. an interesting perspective. Talk about how you got to see, because you mentioned the, the shutting down and how that went, and then you've seen things kind of open back up again and face-to-face is happening. We're okay. doing interviews like this again. Take us through those that, that, that experience that you've seen of that opening back up again. Right, too. right. Well, <laughs> it's been a real pleasure um, because in some ways I get to be um, new to Austin P, new to campus and new to this job even semester after this semester because I have not had one consistent semester since I have been here. I mean, my first semester here, we were still really sinking down into COVID and it was truly a time of fear. Um, we were still trying to carry on and hold classes, um, but it was really truly a time of uncertainty. Campus was extremely quiet. There, there was really no faculty here. We were really teaching rem fully remote. But we were recognizing the need to be a little bit back, right? And, and I think after that first semester in fall of 2020, we saw a light at the end of the tunnel. Things got actually a little bit better, right? And then all of a sudden, we were right back into the throes of, of COVID and it got way worse again. And that's what it's been like. It's been sort of like a rolling tide of sort of getting better and then getting worse and then getting better. And so every semester has really presented different challenges. So for me, I, I would actually say some of the hardest time was when we just weren't sure what was around the corner. So what it was the, um, it, while knowing we were gonna be fully remote, while knowing sort of we were in the depths of COVID was scary and uncertain, at least we could kind of see the windshield ahead of us, the end of the car, right, in front of us or the road. But it was those weeks um, through the summer and through the transition of semesters where, uh, it, for me, it was actually more difficult to say, are we gonna be able to be in person? Are we gonna have to stay remote? What's the combination? And so um, it really has been a slow progression of being able to trans transition back to fully, um, more fully in person. Now I will say, this semester, this fall semester has been like, I'm a brand new employee again. I have never seen campus this alive with students. I've never gone through an opening weekend and orientation weeks where we, we had hundreds of families on, on campus. So for me, in some ways, I'm excited because usually by the start of your third year, you're really into a routine. You're really like, okay, I know how to do this. It's starting to become a little bit like Con, you know, routine and you know what's, what to expect. I feel like a new employee still in the sense of literally every semester has been completely different experience, but so exciting this semester to see um, faculty back, students back fully, right? So I got a chance for, to participate for the first time in that the tradition of um, welcome weekend where we made pan where senior leadership got to make pancakes for the incoming students, you know, during welcome weekend at, at 11 o'clock at night. That was the first time that I had gotten to participate in that event and I had always heard about it. And it was really exciting to see the, 
the cafeteria packed with students and live music. It was so exciting. And so um, that's just been really a pleasure. Um, I've been this semester too doing what I wanted to do my first semester here, which was usually when a provost comes to campus, one of the things that they do is they do a listening tour, right? They go from all of their departments and all of the academic support departments and they spend time just talking and listening and meeting people face to face. Well, I'm starting my third year and I'm finally getting to do that. And so I've had the opportunity and pleasure to really start going around and visiting departments and spending time with faculty and academic support staff uh, and, and just getting to talk to them, listen to them, hear the challenges, hear the achievements since we've been able to return uh, to a fully engaged campus. So it's been a lot of fun. It is, and yeah. it's been great. We got to yeah. see you at our Department of Communication meeting, too. And like you said, you got to see all the other folks, which is so awesome, yeah. right, to get to see the faces and not the little Zoom screen with the little right. square, with, with the, little, the, boxes, the right? rectangle boxes, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So if you're just tuning in, I'm Mike and Terrell with 91.9 Public Affairs, APSU TV, and Dr. Maria Cronley, our provost here at Austin P, is joining us talking about how we're slowly and surely getting back to a more normal sense of things here at the P. And uh, we've been talking about how things have been unfolding, which has been awesome. Some challenges too though, um, and not just us, but nationwide, a lot of colleges dealing with COVID are seeing uh, their enrollments have dropped. Uh, and the nationwide um, average has been about 9%. How are we looking here at Austin P with our enrollment? How are we, are we um, able to keep things going strong? And I know we'll talk about some initiatives to help with that too in just a second. Right, but. absolutely. So yeah, so, it, so even prior to COVID hitting, we knew that the college, the, the, the pie was gonna get smaller in the United States, that the number of student age, uh, 18 year olds basically, who were, who were gonna go to college was gonna drop. That's just a demographic reality. Um, and that was, is, is, and that's gonna be a phenomenon that's gonna be with us for a few years. So they called that the enrollment cliff, right? That we were headed toward that natural demographic, dem demographic decline in the number of, of student age, um, uh, population. Unfortunately, COVID just exacerbated that, right? Mm -hmm. We saw students that, so, so in the fall of, between the spring of 2020 and the fall of 2020 enrollment cycles, we um, actually were headed into a pretty strong enrollment year. And over that summer, we melted hundreds of students, 500 plus students, because specifically of COVID, that we had students that really who had had to finish their senior year remote, didn't feel like they could transition effectively into college that in, under that modality, <clears throat> or just decided this is such a scary and uncertain time, I'm just gonna take a gap year or walk away for a while. And so we really had um, some students that decided you know, college might not be for me or I'm gonna work or delay. Unfortunately, that has created a ripple effect. We did see a little bit of a national bounce back in fall of 21, but unfortunately it wasn't enough to mitigate the, the, degrees, the, the natural decreases we knew were coming and to make up for what we, the declines we saw in 2020. Fall of 22, similarly, again, we saw a little bit of a rebound, but across the state of Tennessee, um, the college going rate, unfortunately, has dropped significantly. And it's not just the traditional 18 year olds who, who have been truly affected by COVID. Um, we're seeing fewer adult um, age students that are coming back to college or trying to finish or complete degrees. Um, we're seeing um, uh, just fewer, uh, fewer people who maybe started before COVID coming back. So there's been a lot of a, a lot of issues that have impacted the whole state. Some of those are economic effects. Mm -hmm. um, given the labor market is very strong, we know that there's a labor shard shortage and wages are very high. Um, many students who might be part-time students with us are choosing right to sit out right now and work so that they, cause, because they can earn a higher wage. So there's a really a lot of variables that affect our enrollment. So unfortunately, we've seen down enrollment um, in uh, 2019, actually the year before COVID, we saw a lower freshman class. And I think that was in part because of the 
d enrollment cliff that was coming and some other factors. Then, unfortunately, we had the COVID years, 20, 2020 and 2021. So we've seen really three years of down enrollment. We're going to have to dig out from that. for they, Those years will follow us for a while. So overall enrollment and headcount is a little bit under stress still. And I think we, we have seen another dip this fall um, with overall headcount. But I think that's because of those trailing three years. Mm -hmm. Incoming numbers looking a little better for us. So I feel like we are bucking the trend a little bit in the state. Uh, and so our freshman class is up a little bit um, and um, our transfer numbers are up a little bit. And so those are good numbers. Um, our military students are up a little bit and our um, international students. We're actually back to pre-COVID levels in terms of international students and in fact this year the highest number of international students we've ever had. So those are really good optimistic and positive numbers. So I think we have, I hope, sort of turned the corner and we'll, we'll continue to sort of buck this trend um, in terms of kind of going in the wrong direction in terms of incoming classes. Our new academic master plan is <coughs> certainly um, putting in place some ambitious goals, but not unrealistic goals. I think um, the, our last strategic plan had ambitious uh, overall enrollment goals that were probably a little bit more aspirational than, re than, maybe, than maybe realistic. These enrollment goals, I think, that we're striving toward are, are hopefully realistic toward the size of our infrastructure and also to what we think we can achieve. We might both need a bottle of water. I know, yeah. Good. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Please continue. I'm sure, sorry. absolutely. <coughs> so, uh, you know, so that's sort of the enrollment snapshot, I would say. Um, the other part of the enrollment snapshot, though, that's very, very important. We often fo focus and talk about the incoming class or, or the, the, the transfer students and things like that. Um, the other part of our enrollment picture is retention and persistence to graduation. Those are very, very important. And frankly and, and candidly, we've, we've had a mixed bag of success, right? Over the years, we sort of go up and down. Um, and I'm happy to say that we're up this year. Um, and um, though, so that's a good thing. What we need to do, though, is get to a sustained um, upward positive and stabilized trend. So we're at about almost 67% um, a first year retention this year. That means our freshmen that started last year, 67% of them retained to this year. That's good. Um, our academic master plan though is, is trying to make, is, is making a concerted effort and putting in tactics to try to get us over 70%. I'd like to see us get to that. That won't happen overnight, but a sustained 70% would, would help us in our enrollment. And so it's really about putting in measures and tactics <clears throat> to help students um, retain past that first year and persist to graduation. Because that's really, that's why we're here. It's not about getting just students in the door. It's helping, it's fulfilling the educational promise that we've made to walk them across the stage. And so for me, that's the goal, right? So, so as much as we often talk about incoming enrollment, overall enrollment, what's really important here is student success is a big part of that. To the rescue, <laughs> some water. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yes, and, and I wanted to bring up two of uh, those three, <clears throat> excuse me, those three key initiatives that were recently unveiled yeah. at the Gov's preview day that, that fold into what you're talking about. Could Absolutely. you share with more of those about those? Sure, so, so <clears throat> um, let me take one step back and say, uh, um, because I think it tells a story. When I, when I first arrived here, we obviously were very concerned about admissions and enrollment. And so one of the things we did was we then interim President Whiteside set up a, a task force to look at all the ways in which we're trying to reach out to prospective families and students and market to them and how we did admissions. We made a lot of changes in my first year when, um, you know, while, while we were still battling COVID, we, we were also trying to address some of these strategic challenges that we had. So one of the things that we did in my first year was we re-looked at how we do our achievement scholarship. At that time, we were, I would definitely say, if not the lowest, one of the lowest in the states in how we, how and the amount we would award in terms of our achievements scholarships. 
we changed our methodology, we changed our criteria, um, and we changed the, the, just the amount of achievement scholarships for incoming students that we were offering. And it's grown a lot over my last three years. The other thing we did was we changed the way we, the types of students that we talk to um, when they're still in high school. So we used to only be talking to, to seniors and now we've really expanded that down into juniors and sophomores and freshmen because we know that students are thinking about college earlier and earlier. So um, that was something that we did sort of in my first year. We also expanded some of our professional partnerships um, in, ha in, in um, companies and, and third party pr providers that we use to help market ourselves. So fast forward to this year, um, now again in partnership with President Lucari, he has formed another enrollment task force to again help us be, think about ways to be innovative, creative, entrepreneurial about and new things we can do on the admission side. So we have three really new, out of that several new exciting initiatives are coming out, but three that you've just mentioned um, I'll highlight here. One is, um, one is the um, Austin P experience. We're really excited about this. This is really a, a two-pronged experience for next year's incoming class. The first is a four-year graduation guarantee, and that is essentially um, come, do what you need to do, <laughs> you know, follow, follow your plan uh, for getting your bachelor's degree, and we will guarantee that you'll walk across the stage in four years, and if not, then we'll pay for the remaining time that you need to, to be successful. Uh, not surprisingly, there are some terms and conditions to that, so you want to read the fine print to that. Um, but it's a promise that we want to make to our incoming class, that if they kind of do what they need to do, we'll do what we need to do to help live up to that promise. The other piece of that is that once you've been with us and you've shown that you can be academically successful, once you've gotten past those initial credit hours um, and you're in a good academic standing, that we want to give every student an opportunity to have what we're calling the Austin P experience, and that is um, going to college is a lot more than just going to class, than just getting that, hopefully A or you know B in that class, and um, fulfilling your credit hour requirements. Being a college student means that you also need to have a college experience and have experiences that are gonna prepare you for that first job and for your whole life in the workforce and, and to prepare you to be a better person. And so we want you to have additional experiences while you're here at Austin P. And so part of the Austin P experience is a $2,000 grant um, for, for um, students to be able to take advantage of, of something that we call a high impact practice. So that might be um, going on a study abroad um, spending, you know, going for, for a few weeks to Europe or going to Costa Rica or, or something like that, or a service learning project, right? Participating in building houses with Habitat for Humanity through a university-sponsored trip. It might be going to Washington, D.C. To, to see, uh, to, to, to uh, hear our um, U.S. legislature work at work, right? Um, so it might be something like that. It might also be engaging in an internship. Maybe you want to take an unpaid internship, but you need to supplement your own income in order to be able to participate in that experience. It might be um, working with a faculty member on undergraduate uh, research. And so being able to go and take that research to a conference or to present that work at a professional colloquia or symposium giving you the resources to be able to do those things, um, giving you those experiences. And so um, we are, and it's not going to be one of those competitive things where you have to like audition or compete with other students to get that. Every student gets this opportunity. If you're in good academic standing, you're going to get the experience. You just have to tell us what you're going to do. Um, and so we're really excited to, to launch that because we really hope to bring more enriching experiences to the students. So, uh, Austin P experience. The next thing um, is that we're putting in place new legacy scholarships. So these are, we've never offered these before. So a, an incoming uh, scholarship for freshmen who have a parent or a grandparent, brother, sister, who have, um, who have come to Austin P. So we know that we have lots of students that have relatives that have gone through Austin P and we want to recognize that. 
The third is the um, uh, Austin P. Uh, guarantee for 23, I think is what we're calling it. And that is for students that make the commitment to us um, to um, come here by May, of 2023 and that means that they sign up for an orientation if they're required to do housing they have signed up for their housing um, so they've taken the steps they need to do to to be fully admitted and 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 commit to an orientation that we will guarantee and guarantee if they do that by may that we guarantee then their pricing uh, for their first year for for 2023 2024 school year that will guarantee them this year's prices in other words a freeze on tuition a freeze on fees and a freeze on housing and and meal plans um, so that um, I will tell you that as we've done preview days, the parents are very excited about that. So yes. the ones that are paying the bills are, are super excited <clears throat> about that. Um, so those are, I think, are the three initiatives mm -hmm. that you've talked about. Um, the backside of that, though, is that we're making sure we're putting forward, putting together the infrastructure to support that. So my registrar's office is working on making sure that we have everything in place mechanically for these high impact practices to be able to take place. I'm talk, starting to talk to departments and faculty about what are the high impact practices that you're gonna offer students and how do we organize those and how, and how do we make sure that you have the resources to pull those off. And so we're doing our part on the back end of academic affairs to make sure we have the infrastructure put in place to, to support those things. The other thing that we're doing is we're, we're continuing to look at other scholarships too. So we're looking at how we do our transfer scholarships. We're looking at how we do our dual enrollment scholarships. And so I think you'll see changes in those also um, in, in, in being put in place shortly within the next few weeks. And so I think those are some of the other things ex exciting that we're gonna do. Um, from a <coughs> um, admissions perspective, the, one of the other things that, some of the other things we're doing to make sure that we're reaching as many prospective families as we can is for the first time ever, we have put um, admissions personnel um, out of state. We have our first admissions recruiter down in Alabama, which we've really not done before. I think um, that this experiment will continue and actually expand. I'd like to see us expand admissions personnel into other states um, to, help, to help support admissions. Um, the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to do a road show in the spring. And by that, I mean senior leadership, the president, myself, and the deans are literally going to get on a bus, and we are going to go throughout the state talking to prospective families um, and um, helping them see the value of coming to Austin P. So I think that's going to be an exciting road show uh, and um, something new we've never done before. So I'm excited about that. That's very exciting. Yeah. Are you going to bring the chopper too? Uh, I hope we I hope can. So. You know, that, that is actually a great idea, <coughs> and I'm sure it. we can, at least for some of the places, that would be very cool um, and, and something we can totally think about and do. So awesome. I'll have to write that down as soon as the interview great. is over. Great, yeah, so it's no wonderful. That. We have just a few minutes left. Okay. So what, what other thoughts did you have about uh, moving forward for Austin P that you wanted to share with us? So, oh, good. Well, well, um, other thoughts as we move forward. So the first thing I want to do is just take the opportunity to say thank you to the Austin P community for, I've never really had an opportunity to publicly say thank you for hiring me, thank you for having me here, thank you for giving me the chance to build, uh, to build the, all, upon all of the great things that we are at Austin P and take us to the next level and to the next place that we want to go. For me as a senior leader, my goal is to add value to the landscape however I can, make a loved place more loved. So for me, any way I can do that, I want to do that. So if you have ideas, bring them to me. We in Academic Affairs are really here to support the academic enterprise. We want to make sure that we're supporting our great faculty, our great staff, um, to help those students be successful and get them across the stage. That's my number one goal, right? Get students here who can benefit from the great education we offer and help them persist and get across that stage. Awesome. So, thank you so much yeah, for your time, you. Dr. Cronley. Thank you. So I'm Micah Terrell with 91.9 Public Affairs, and we've had a great time with Dr. Maria Cronley, our provost and our senior vice president of academic affairs. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>